And welcome to the Cosmic Shambles Sunday Science question and answer session. Uh, Robin will be joining us a little bit later. He's got a family commitment, uh, but he will be along because obviously he can't wait. He can't miss out on the answers to all of these questions. Uh, so just before we get going, we have the usual list of admin do support us on Patreon. That helps keep everything going. It's patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. There are lots of Patreon exclusive things out now. Um, 
there's this uh, series Robin's doing called An Uncanny Hour, which this week looks at the novel I Am Legend, which I have to confess I have never read. Uh, so I should probably do with some education there. And uh, the latest episode of Tips for Existence has uh, Andrew in, uh, and next week it will be Chris Jackson. So those are Patreon exclusives, extra reasons to support on Patreon if you can. But obviously, if you can't, there's still lots of free Cosmic Shambles events going on online, so you won't miss out. Um, if you'd like to ask questions as we're going along, we do have lots of questions from our audience today but there, we've got room for more if you'd like them so uh, the way to do that is to find the live chats somewhere beneath on the screen you're watching I don't know exactly where it is because uh, I never watch myself funny enough so you can put the questions there or you can tweet at Cosmic Shambles and uh, they will be passed on to us and um, just a reminder for a special event coming up that uh, next Tuesday two days away I think two and a bit days at 7pm uh, Robin and I are hosting an online event with the Royal Institution, all about Ernest Rutherford. So he's one of those physicists that um, is talked about a lot in the work he did, but actually no one's written a really good biography of him or not not one that is uh, easily available. So we're going to be talking all about him and we'll be joined by um, Jim Markalili, John Butterworth, Linda Cremonisi and uh, Sonyara Bhargava. Uh, and it's free or pay what you can and you do have to register. So even though it's free, you do have to actually click through something and register beforehand. So do remember to do that. And you can do that at either the Royal Institution site or the Cosmic Shambles site. So um, that is all the admin, I think. So we will get started on not quite the question. So all the, all the beginning bits, we're not going to miss out on the beginning bits just because Robin's not with us this week. Um, so our guests this week, you will meet properly in a minute. They, if you don't know them already, they are Dr. Anna uh, Porzhaisky and Dr. Jess Wade. Um, but before we get to them and their show and tells, I want to tell you about what, what was happening in science this week back in history. And this week we're going all the way back to 1948. And there was a paper published in 1948 by an oceanographer called Henry Stommel. And you may not have heard of him, but he was one of the great uh, oceanographers of the middle of the last century. And what this paper was about, it, it's got a quite a long name. It's called the Western Intensification of Wind-Driven Ocean Currents. But basically, he explained the Gulf Stream. So for uh, centuries, sailors had noticed that there was this very fast, intense stream that you know curled around the American coast and then zoomed out across the Atlantic. And there was nothing that was the same on the other side. So there's a really big difference between West and East. And it, this is known as Western intensification. And and it has all kinds of really important consequences. And it's actually the Gulf Stream isn't the only one. There's the Kurashio in the Pacific. There's an equivalent near South, South Africa. Um, and so Stommel was the first guy who explained that this was because the Coriolis force varies with latitude. So as you get closer to the pole, the Coriolis effect gets stronger. And this is this crucial part of our ocean engines. And it really did. He So basically, he explained it with a theoretical model, and no one had done that before. And he actually predicted things that were later found when it came to deep currents. So um, so it's a bit, it's one of the, I mean, fine, I'm an ocean scientist, I care about that kind of thing. But in terms of explaining how the ocean engine works, that April paper in 1948 was a critical moment in just understanding why these weird features were there and just how important they are. And it actually led the way to, he, Stommel was also the first person who suggested that um, the, oh, the thermohaline circulation, so the big overturning circulation, could have different states uh, and you might switch between one and the other. So the, the root of a lot of things. So that was that was uh, that paper from Henry Stommel in 1948. So that is the bit of science and history. And now you've had your history lesson a history lesson for the afternoon. I can't even speak today. Um, let's meet our guests. So Anna, let's come to you now. You have a handmade, a scientist search for meaning through making, which is a bit of a tongue twister, but it's a very good title. So <laughs> before we get to your show and tell, tell us a little about the book. Sure. So this is a book all about materials and making. I'm a material scientist. And a few years ago, I had kind of a crushing realisation that although I was supposedly an expert in materials because I'd been learning all about, you know, their physical properties, the graphs, the formulae, all about how materials are the way they are. Um, I didn't really know anything about how they work in a kind of hands on way. So I didn't understand. I couldn't throw a pot on a potter's wheel. I I couldn't like forge an iron bar in a blacksmith's workshop. I had no idea about this other side of materials, which is craft. So in the book, I take the reader through 10 different materials, 10 chapters and meet 
craftspeople and makers and have a go at their crafts to really kind of paint a fuller picture on the materials that I'm supposedly an expert on. But I had this huge kind of gap. And just very quickly, we won't, we've got lots of other things, we've got lots of other things, but just very quickly, which was your favourite of all the crafts you tried? Oh my God, it was probably blacksmithing just for its kind of sheer drama around it like you're there's it kind of just batters all of the senses it's loud it's hot um it's it's kind of tiring there's sweat dripping down your face um and like shaping steel shaping orange hot steel is just such a dramatic process so that was probably my favorite awesome and it's very clever from a materials point of view as well i was impressed they worked all this stuff out without having any idea <laughs> about dislocations but anyway exactly. um, okay so you've got a show and tell for us as well tell us what that is I have. So as part of the book, as I say, I met all these makers and had a go at their crafts. And in the wood chapter, I went to a wood carving workshop with a man in East London called Barn the Spoon. So what I've brought for you is my series of wooden spoons that I've made (laughs) and a little kind of journey through my own psyche in terms of um, sort of how they represent me. Because one of the things I noticed when I was making this book was the fact that as as makers we kind of put our personalities into the objects we make. So this is my first wooden spoon can show you here it's quite a long handle it looks like a spoon it looks like a spoon but unfortunately something went a bit wrong so if i zoom in here you can see that the sides of the spoon has sort of been gouged out like this top bit right um, and that's because <laughs> i basically went backwards in the process because i thought that i knew better than barn the spoon in terms of how to make a spoon i obviously don't because this is the first one i ever made so if you try and drink soup out of this spoon Um, it's going to spill all out of the sides. My second spoon, I went back at lunchtime because I was so mortified at having done it wrong. I went back at lunchtime and then carved a completely teacher's pet perfect spoon, um, which kind of reveals the side of my personality, which is very much a teacher's pet, (laughs) wanting to do things perfectly. Um, A bit of an issue with authority figures. And then the third one, we were just given free reign. Um, and so I made this one and it is probably the ugliest wooden spoon you've ever seen in your life. It's quite large. Um, it's got a really like heavy, thick neck here, which makes the whole thing too heavy to use. And then this sort of ra- randomly square, um, square kind of bowl at the end. It's very shallow. There's sort of gashes in the back of it. Um, it's all very ugly. So really, I didn't have very much success with wooden spoon carving, but I did really enjoy it. Um, and actually during lockdown, I bought myself a whittling knife and an axe and went off to the woods, as you do in lockdown, um, to try and continue spoon carving. And I bought my final show and tell is um, a spoon that is actually unfinished. <laughs> and the reason it's unfinished is that as I was carving it, it's quite difficult. And actually, this is really nicely um, flowing into what I hope Jess is going to talk about. So when you carve a spoon, I'm right handed. So you sort of scoop round with the knife. And so it's very easy to do this side of the spoon because if you're right handed, but it's very difficult to do the far side of the spoon if you're right handed. So my idea was I'll just use my left hand (laughs) to do this other side of the spoon. And immediately I chopped the top off my thumb knuckle, um, a really (laughs) very deep um, cut in my thumb knuckle. And actually, um, I then had to kind of st- sit on this bench in these woods with sort of a sanitary towel wrapped around my thumb with my hand in the air for about half an hour to stop the bleeding. Um, so so those are the stories of my spoons. The, you chopped off the thing and then you did the carving in the woods. There was no delay between the, <laughs> the wood and the carving of the wood. Yeah, very much so. So I brought my axe to the woods, um, chopped off the wood, uh, try, tried to carve the spoon, chopped the top of my thumb, and then all spoon carving had to stop because there was a lot of blood. <laughs> well, I, should anyone be in need of wooden spoons, it might not be the quickest way to acquire new kitchen uh, implements, it's but it true. sounds educational and dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to finish that spoon? Or is it going to stay, um, remain as a, as a, as a um, uh, monument to your folly? <laughs> <laughs> so I think actually, funnily enough, because when you carve spoons, it's called um, you use something called green wood, which is wood that is just chopped down. It's got quite a high water content. After it's after a while, it kind of dries out and becomes much harder. So I think, unfortunately, this is just going to be a monument to my own failings. But you learn from it, so it's all right. I learned brilliant. It. Yeah, never awesome. carved left-handed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unless you're left-handed, presumably. Um, Jess, let's, Jess, come, let's to come to you. To you. Uh, so yes. you're you're at um, Imperial College London, 
and you you also have a book that is already out so Anna's comes out in a couple of weeks I think uh, I didn't yeah. say that um Jess's is already out and it's called the S- spectacular signs of the very very small so I mean it does sort of I assume it does what it says on the tin does it <laughs> it completely does what it says on the tin I actually have a copy I don't know if you've got copies of yours yet Anna I'm guessing you do it's I completely do. beautiful so it's called Nano it's a picture book it's for kind of people aged five plus so it's very much an introduction to material science and it's really there because I think there's a massive gap in the way that we teach young people about materials and how important they are in our lives as as Anna's book tells to a slightly more grown-up audience materials are completely transforming the way that we interact with planet earth and with society and I don't think we tell people early enough how great they are but also kind of introduction to atoms and molecules and structures before before you get to GCSE, before you have to make those tricky choices about what you want to study and which exams you want to take, I think it's so important we talk about subjects like chemistry and materials and physics and how we all work together. So so Nano is very much that. It's it's a picture book. So there are really beautiful illustrations to accompany all of the fantastic science that I'm hoping that I managed to tell. And then also a few kind of applications of different nanotechnologies. So the way that we're using nanomaterials now for, for future technologies and what I hope they'll become. And, and yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a call, right? Because we need as many scientists from as many different backgrounds as possible to come and work in this field. And what Anna and I and you, Helen, really know is that the best ideas come when we have the most diverse teams possible. And I'm really hoping that somehow in this book, every young person and their parents who get to read it sit down and think, this is a really exciting area. This is something I want to read more about. And maybe if, if if we choose to work in these labs or choose to study these subjects, we could contribute to it too, because we really need those fantastic ideas. And how hard, it's one of those interesting things, I think, always with nanotechnology that um, it's, there is this great puzzle in a way that it's the stuff you can't see, you know, the people are far, I think on average, people are far more fascinated by the sky than other areas of science, you know, compared with there's a lot of science out there but it's because you can see it right and then you know the sort of stuff I work on breaking waves and bubbles you can see them I mean I work on the bits that are just too fast and too small to see but you know I can see a breaking wave and yet the stuff that you're working on and presumably the stuff that's in the book I mean you no human will ever directly see that is does that make it harder sell do you think or are people on board with that idea I think it probably makes it a little bit of a harder sell but it doesn't make it any less fascinating an endeavor you know I think the challenge challenge of being able to understand something that you can't see with visible light or with your eyes is just an incredibly complex but incredibly worthy challenge to persevere you know we develop these fancy microscopes we come up with really cool kinds of spectroscopy we develop these really expensive light sources all to better understand these materials and then I guess the cool thing about nanomaterials and structures is that we really see their effects you know whether it's in kind of personalized medicine or ultra efficient displays for our mobile phones, we can tell they're doing something brilliant. So even if we can't physically visualize an atom or a molecule, we can find ways to do that. And we can really see the way that they impact our world. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. I just don't think we tell people enough that this is what's going on. This is why your mobile phone display is 10 times better now than it was five years ago. This is why you can now have this really extraordinary cancer treatment. We don't talk enough about nanomaterials. We kind of have this, this fear. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, through books like mine and Anna's and others, we can start to kind of tackle and challenge that. Brilliant. Um, and what is your show and tell? <laughs> It's so boring compared to Anna's, but my show and tell is these beautiful cardboard boxes. So recently, all of us have been working, you know, when we work in research labs, especially experimental research labs like the one that I work in. I work as a material scientist at Imperial, but I rely very heavily on materials that have been synthesized by chemists. The chemists are in another lab at the moment. And usually, you know, pre-pandemic, we'd just meet, we'd have a coffee, they'd hand me, you know, a small vial of a few milligrams of material. I'd take it back to the clean room. I'd have a fantastic time investigating it, trying some things out. And at the moment, that's really hard because we're not allowed to cross campuses. We're all on these funny rotors about when we can and can't be in. We can't have those kind of, 
hey, do you want to just give this a go? Here's some cool molecules I made. Those interactions are, you know, happening virtually. We're doing them on Zoom. And so now I get sent probably about twice a week these funny packages, sometimes to my home address, sometimes to my address at Imperial. And then I kind of have to go in and go into the lab and work it out. But it's all about kind of, you know, for me, why these objects are important is because we've really got to rethink the way that we collaborate in the pandemic. We've really had to become much more efficient in the way that we plan our experiments and much more creative in the way that we think about working with each other. But I think it's been absolutely brilliant for, for working with people that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with otherwise. So I'm grateful to my great chemistry friends in the White City campus of Imperial for endlessly sending these things via via a courier and, and so I can keep investigating and we can keep learning more about these kind of incredible materials. I love the idea of science having become sort of era, you know, paperbacks, like you had to meet, you know, clandestine meetings and mysterious things being passed in dark brown paper packages. Sometimes I feel like I'm always in for a tr trade. I'm like, I've got Arsenal season tickets, so can I have some polymer? If you give me some Arsenal season <laughs> tickets, I'll give you this material. I'm like always out there like a little grifter. Barter economy <laughs> is about to have a whole new <laughs> face to it. Uh, brilliant. Okay, well, if, if, if anyone out there in the audience has questions about any of those things, do stick them in the chat or tweet the matters Trent's keeping an eye on all of that but we will get go on, get going on the questions and I think this first one is um for you Jess it's from Melissa age 10 and Melissa wants to know are all atoms the same size and or do they weigh differently we don't we we're, we're still investigating still investigating all the different atoms and we're still making ways to make new atoms but at the moment that we know they do weigh differently because inside atoms if you've looked Melissa or hopefully you found some grown up who'll tell you how to look inside atoms we know there's a bunch of things the heaviest parts are called protons and neutrons and the number of protons and neutrons varies between the atoms that we look at so, so as we move up, something called the periodic table, which you might have, have, have heard about at school or might have seen a picture of. This is a bunch of all of the different types of atom that we found in, in nature and also that we've been able to make in the lab. And as we move up that from, from number one, which is hydrogen, and kind of creep up this scale, they get heavier and heavier because we put more and more of these protons and neutrons in. So, so they, don't, they don't have all the same size and they don't have all the same weight. And actually, it's those properties of them that make them really, really interesting for us to study, thinking about ways that they join up, ways that they break apart and what happens when those things happen. So I hope that's the right answer, that actually they don't weigh all the same and, and we're still investigating it and we're still trying to study them using these really, really cool techniques to understand them. But it's really you know, the difference between carbon and nitrogen and oxygen is just one or two, one or two extra protons or neutrons like that. The number of things in the middle, the protons actually defines everything about. I mean, it's such a, it's such a simple idea, isn't it? It's lovely. I think it's even more amazing when you think about you think about the way they interact with other elements. So the way that the elements and atoms interact with each other, you can basically define by the family that they're in in the periodic table. And when I, as a physicist, have the with chemists about what we might make next or what molecule might be really interesting to look at, they have this extraordinary encyclopedic knowledge of saying, like, oh, we could just put this in there because that's in that group. And I'm just like, huh? Like, I don't know what you're saying. Or, you know, they have all these fancy words for organic synthesis. But yeah, I think I think it's incredible that a few protons or neutrons or electrons can change a material's property so much. Um, there's actually a really nice bit of history about the discovery of the periodic table um, because it, it was discovered, there was an argument about it because the original paper was published in Russian and not everybody read Russian. And so there was a German researcher who thought he made the great leap. And then they had an argument for about 20 years over who had actually discovered the periodic table because it, 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 the, the paper had been badly translated and the translator had obviously not been a chemist and didn't understand that the, what the really critical point was. So the second guy along um, went, oh, well, this must mean this. And it had been in the original paper, but it wasn't in the translator. Enormous row. Anyway. <laughs> So it's grateful um, that we have the internet. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't happen now. Um, so we've got another question, uh, Anna. This one's for you mm -hmm. from Neil. Um, why do certain things like a metal tray hold heat and others don't? And when do they cool down? Where does the heat go? Oh, great question! Great question. So, um, why 
so we're talking really here about kind of how materials transfer heat and how they conduct heat. Um, and there's in within a material, there's really kind of two key ways that materials conduct heat. Um, confusingly, they've got very similar names. So one of them is called phonons. And this is where if you if you were to zoom into that metal tray, what you'd see is a whole load of atoms, um, usually in a very kind of neat and orderly structure. And as material scientists, we call this a crystal structure. Um, so all these atoms are sort of, they're lined up in a um, 3D kind of lattice shape. And when heat wants to sort of flow through that material, um, when we talk about heat in materials, actually what we're talking about is how much those atoms are vibrating, which is kind of a very unromantic way of sort of describing the the feelings of heat like we kind of interact with them as human beings but in science heat is just how much atoms are vibrating so a very 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 cold atom won't vibrate very much and a very very hot atom will vibrate a lot so if we think then about that metal if one atom is very hot and it's vibrating a lot it can pass and in effect heat up the at the neighboring atom and make that atom hot and this is as it flows down the material, um, it's sort of like a bit of a Mexican wave of kind of heat transfer. Um, so each of the neighbours are making their, their other neighbours hotter. Um, and these kind of waves of heat transfer are called phonons. That is the kind of dominant way that materials conduct heat up to around 400 or 500 degrees Celsius. Any hotter than that, then the dominant form is called photons. And this is where the atoms are vibrating so much that they start giving out electromagnetic radiation that contains heat. Now, actually, all atoms are giving out electromagnetic radiation, um, but when you heat them up, it's giving out infrared radiation, which is what we experience as heat. So you've got photons and you've got phonons, um, and those are the ways that materials will conduct heat. Um, your other, your second part of your question was to do with where does the heat go again? when they cool down? Oh yes, oh yeah, but we were talking about metals, weren't we? So with metals, those atoms are really kind of closely packed together, so it's really easy for the neighbouring atoms to heat each other up. Um, and there's also the electrons in the material are not kind of attached to the atoms. The electrons are able to sort of flow around in the material in what we call a delocalized electron C. Um, all that means is that electrons can flow around and it's why metals can conduct electricity as well. But those electrons can also um, conduct heat. So that's really the main reason that metals are so good at conducting heat. Where the heat goes is that um, it tends to just dissipate into the environment. So when if you've got your metal tray, then it's in contact with the air around it and the air around it contains lots of atoms as well. So in the same way that as the heat traveled down the metal tray, um, the atoms were sort of bumping into each other and transferring their heat. They can also transfer their heat into the atoms in the air and eventually warm up the air next to the tray very slightly. And then that way the heat dissipates away. Cool. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, liked that nod to the ocean with the I see of electrons. I feel like we're really <laughs> trying as material scientists to, to contribute to Helen's work too. <laughs> well, it's one of those ways, it's like bubble. The problem is that it's got people use it as a general thing. And then sometimes I get emails from people who are very cross because they haven't quite got on board with the idea that there's a, a physical a bubble and then a word that is a bubble like idea. <laughs> And they're not necessarily exactly the same thing. I right. guess we've had a lot of those in the last year when we all went into bubbles. <laughs> so um, yeah, well, yeah. I, so one of my favourite things this week so um, was in Sydney Airport. So Australia and New Zealand had a travel bubble for all of, I think, four days before it shut down again. Um, but in Sydney Airport, there are massive signs on the walls which have a black background, the silver fern of New Zealand, and it says hooray for bubbles in the middle of the airport, all over the airport. I think it's fabulous. Um, so I'm not, not always complaining about the bubbles being used in multiple ways. Um, all right. So this one might, this next one might be one for you, Jess. Uh, Thomas G. This is, um, he is planning on buying a new TV. And somewhere along the following the reviews, he's ended up falling down the rabbit hole of quantum dots. And he says, so it'd be good if you could tell us what a quantum dot is, um, if you've got a good definition. And then also... He asks why passing more light through a quantum dot doesn't increase brightness, only heat. Now, I don't know what he's read about quantum dots, but what do you know about quantum dots, Jess? Do you, do you know anything? I don't know if it's your area of uh, expertise. So I know a little. I mean, I actually 
primarily work with organic light emitting diodes. So, so carbon based molecules that emit light when we pass a charge through them. And these are the OLED displays. So if you've got an iPhone, if you've got one of the Samsung galaxies, if you've seen OLED displays, then I work with these. And what's really incredible about the materials that we work with, these carbon based semiconductors, is that we can tune their optical properties by changing their chemistry. So if we want them to emit a different color of light, we can just fiddle with their, or the very clever chemists that I work with and who send me these fantastic cardboard boxes, they can change their chemistry and then we can tune that color that they emit or absorb. And that's really beautiful when you compare them to conventional semiconductors. And the way that these, these OLED TVs work is, is actually much more simple is that we inject electrons and holes, so, so, so positively charged electrons, from either side of our active layer, so our pixel, our thing that's emitting light, they travel through that organic material, and when that electron and hole recombine, they emit light, and the light depends on the chemical structure of the molecule. Quantum dots are a little bit different from these molecules that I work with, because they are nanoparticles. So these are kind of semiconducting nanoparticles. So very relevant for my beautiful, wonderful book, Nano. But actually these are, these are human made, tiny, tiny bundles of atoms and molecules, which will emit light of a particular wavelength when we inject electrons into them. So very similar to the way that the materials that I work with emit light. We inject our charges and then and then they'll emit light and we can tune and change the chemistry of our quantum dots so that they can have different types of, of light coming out. I would recommend to Thomas G that he investigates um, different OLED displays because these are really, really exceptional. They have um, I'm not a salesperson for OLED displays. But they have really, really high brightness, really, really great colors, incredibly fast response time and a really wide viewing angle. And we can also make them have a really, really long lifetime. So when it comes to things like trying to keep your television for longer or not waste as many electronic components as we do at the moment, then OLEDs are a really, really great way to do that. You can also replace individual pixels that might break really, really easily with, with OLED displays. So, so quantum dots are nice. But from the display people that I've worked with, they're not something that, that people are, I'm probably going to get attacked on social media for saying this. So they may not be the best option. I would, I would, I would investigate OLEDs because I really love them. Oh, the quantum dot sales people are going to be there on Twitter up in arms. They'll be emailing me. They'll email me. They'll email Imperial. They say, who is this joker? But I would really push OLEDs. I think they're the way forward. Well, you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so well, that actually leads something in there leads quite well on. I mean, these are sort of going alternately, which is nice. But um, for you, and there's a question from Joe Tagwe. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, thinking ahead here, uh, Joe. So they ask: um, Are there any other materials in development that could have the same polluting potential as plastic? So I guess the idea here is that there's always this: Oh, we've got to invent a new thing, and then we. At the same time, we're worrying about the problems from the old things we invented. Are there any new things coming along that are generate, you know, new materials that have the sort of problems plastic has? What do you think? I think I don't know if Jess will agree with this. I think increasingly material scientists, as they're inventing their new materials in the lab, they are increasingly thinking about the whole lifetime of that material. So not only where is it going to end up, but also where is it coming from? Um, what are the ingredients that we're putting into it? Are they sustainable? Um, How is this material going to be used in its lifetime? And then also where is it going to end up? It is something that we're thinking much more about, I would say, compared to historically. Um, the, all that being said, the type of material science that goes on in laboratories tends to be, in general, for, for science's sake, rather than um, for, for any particular... We do it because we're interested and we want to develop new materials and develop new processes. So I would say that, in general, material scientists are still going to develop materials that are... Um, so-called polluting um, because we can still understand interesting things about them and just because they're not perfect when we develop them it doesn't mean that we can can't then tweak the properties down the road to make them more sustainable so there's always this kind of interplay between we want to understand these materials more and the science comes first um, but then equally there are material scientists that are working on solving 
the problems of sustainability of materials, for example, plastics. Um, the other thing that I would say about this, though, is that plastics are not the only polluting materials. All materials that we use take from the environment in some way, um, either through you know the, how we source them, how we mine them, metal mine for example, or how they end up, you know, ceramics are not biodegradable and they're also not recyclable, um, whereas plastic is recyclable. So th when we talk about sustainability of materials, it's such a complex problem. And actually there are there are whole, um, you know, areas of science dedicated to really assessing how we assess how um, how sustainable materials are. Um, and then once we understand that, then we can start going towards a better direction in terms of making our whole material world more sustainable. So I have something to add on this question, because I think that there is a big uh, there is something that is about to come and bite a lot of these issues. And it is that there are a lot of materials which have small amounts, very small amounts of metals that can be toxic in them. So, for example, car tires and the brake discs on cars and that kind of thing. They're mostly rubber, but they have small amounts of other yeah. elements, perhaps bismuth, perhaps, mm. you know, I, there's a whole range of them. actually. Right. And the problem is that if you have a lump of lead, you can if you if you want to reuse it, you can reuse that lump of lead. But the problem with a lot of these sort of they're, they're trace materials. It's also true in batteries. They're used for doping semiconductors very commonly, that kind of thing. And the problem is that when you finish with that item, you haven't got a lump of stuff that's all the same stuff. You've got some stuff with like 0.1 percent of some other type of atom. Mm. And that other type of atom can drift off and cause problems in the environment. And I think that's the next big problem for recycling, because um in a lot of these cases, most of the stuff, uh, you know, is fine. It, you know, it, maybe it does biodegrade, but those little bits that are in it that basically can't be extracted, they they're a problem. And I think we're going to hear much more about those because because that they make they improve the material properties, right? Mm -hmm. They make things more resistant. They make their heat transfer better. That's why they're in tires, for example, because they improve the heat transfer through the rubber. So they're really useful, but and I think we're going to hear a lot more about those hidden dilute materials you know atoms mm, in things mm. uh, because it's just basically impossible to recycle go on jess yeah and then we need to develop a really really good way to trace and really really transparently know exactly what's in the materials in the products that we're buying i think mm -hmm. i think that's starting to happen because of conversations around the environment but it's really still in its infancy but i would completely echo what anna said you know there's not only a focus on developing sustainable and kind of greener materials, but also on thinking about the processes by which we generate these materials. You know, so many chemistry labs are converting all of their chemistry labs into incredibly energy efficient, but also really thinking about the solvents they use and the precursors they use and the catalysts they use. People are really considerate now in a way that I don't think they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I would yeah. add that the material that I think you know, especially from the field I work on, on kind of new materials for electronic devices. The material I think has caused the most kind of controversy recently is a crystal called the porosite, which which both of you will know and, and lots of the listeners will know. But these are kind of hybrid organic inorganic crystals that make incredibly efficient solar panels, you know, far outpacing our conventional solar panels and far outpacing anything that we've done in the lab recently. The challenge with these materials is they contain lead and sometimes link, leak chlorine, neither of which are very good for mm -hmm. humans. But actually, the research focus on making lead-free perovskites is so huge. The energy, the enthusiasm, we've identified this weird and wonderful crystal. We can put it into these technologies. But now let's have that really interesting blue skies discussion about how we make this something that's environmentally friendly. And I think that's I think it's really exciting. You know, you, you chase that dream of making something like solar technologies and you do that by innovating through material design. I, I can't imagine a better field to be in. Mm, definitely. And I think this this also works with design, right? Because all of the things, things we've been talking about are kind of consumer products and these materials are put out into the world to do amazing things. Um, but if we don't design those products then to be able to be recycled and disassembled and all of those elements, um, you know, removed for recycling, then we have no choice but to throw these materials and these objects into landfill. So it's not only material science that has to really step up and think about sustainability, but also how we design these objects and how we use them. Brilliant. Okay, so, uh, well, the next 
question I have here is probably one for me, actually. It's from Michaela S. And Michaela's daughter would like to know, um, if there's a high tide on the east coast of America, would it be low tide on the west coast of Britain? And uh, the answer is it's it's unfortunately a bit more complicated than that. The first thing is there are two tides a day. Um, but really, the tides, the, t- the way we're kind of taught tides is as if there was a, a planet that was completely covered with ocean and nothing else. There was no land in the way. And the problem is there's quite a lot of land in the way. And so you get you get a wide variety of effects. So sometimes it's a time lag, just it takes water time to move across from one side um, to the other side. So there's a kind of sloshing, you know, it just, it just, there's a lag basically behind the moon that is affected by the, if it's shallow, then there's kind of bottom friction. So it's, you know, that slows it all down. Um, it also can be coming in two directions at once. So around uh, Southampton, for example, there's a double tide, which means that at the peak of the tide, you get a little double bump. And it's because that tide is coming twice. It's coming once around the North Sea side and once up the Channel side. Um, And then you get things that basically the way ocean water works is it sort of sloshes around. If you imagine taking a bucket full of water and kind of moving it in a circle, the water sloshes around. Um, And there's a natural frequency of the basin. So there's a rate it tends to slosh at. And the oceans also have their natural sloshing frequencies. And so there's all these overlaid effects of the lands getting in the way of a perfect tide. Um, And so there are places in the ocean which have no tide at all. The ocean surface doesn't move at all. Um, And there are places like around the coast of Britain, actually. So the Bristol Channel is a good example. A huge tidal range um, just because of the way the land is and where the water is coming from. So um, th- so there isn't a clear answer to whether if there's a high tide on the east coast of America, it might be low tide on the west side of Britain, because even on the west side of Britain, the tide is a different height at different points and it happens at different times of day. So although it's mostly in sync with the moon, it it's not a perfect match. And so tide tide prediction is really tricky actually i mean we're, we're quite good at it but if you really look into the papers that show how it works it, it's just a list have you got it have you thought about this have you thought about this have you thought about this and if you've thought about all of those things then you can make a prediction so so it's not straightforward basically the answer to that question but it is really interesting um and certainly it drives me mad like even you know on so i live on the thames estuary um and uh so the the tide comes all the way up to teddington i'm doing this because it's behind me right now and um the high high tide up uh, putney for example is half an hour later than at Black- blackfriars and it's half an hour later again if you go up towards richmond for example so even within the single estuary because the thames is an estuary not a river in london the tide high tide ch- time changes as you go further up so it, so it's complicated okay. okay let's move back to materials uh, which also have their beautiful complications so we've got a question um Just maybe you can start on this, but um, Anna might have things to say as well. From Michael, this one. And um, so these, this word, he's asking about the word chirality. And there's, he's saying, are the words chirality and handedness interchangeable terms when it comes? Now he says to particles, but I wonder if if he means molecules. Um, So perhaps Jess, you could tell us what chirality is, since you're the closest of all of us to the chemists, I think. Um, and, and just explain a little bit about chirality and handedness in, in molecules. And, and actually, I work with chiral molecules, so this can be more, a, a more perfect question. So, so chiral objects exist as non-superimposable mirror image pairs, which is where we get our concept of handedness, right? Because our hands are non-superimposable posh words, mirror images of each other. So if we put our hands together palm to palm, then they're mirror images. But if you put one on top of the other, then it's not a mirror image. And and that's what our kind of understanding of non-superimposable is. At a subatomic scale, we see chirality in the spins of electrons. So spin up and spin down electrons. At a molecular scale, we think about it in, in molecules. So molecules can have an identical chemical structure, but a different arrangement of molecules in space. And one will be the left-handed version and one will be the right-handed version. And actually, even within that, there's different kinds of chirality. So you can have something that's axially chiral, depending on the bonding around a carbon atom, or you can have something that's helically chiral, depending on whether the molecule can can sit flat in a plane. It will twist up in a kind of corkscrew shape one direction or the other. And then we see chirality at macroscopic scales too. So in kind of the twisted shells of snails or lots and lots of different plants and trees have twisted barks. So we see a lot of chirality. And sometimes I think 
the word handedness is really, really useful to think about things as being left or right handed. But we have to define how we're using that term. So it's hard to look at a tree or a snail and say, oh, that's left handed. You know, it's easy to look at your left hand and say, oh, there's there's my left handed hand. So that's one complication to it. And there you have to, you know, really define where you're looking at it from and how you've decided whether you've got a left handed or a right handed twist. The really interesting discussion, which is a debate that happens often between chemists on, on, on Twitter, is can you say something is really chiral? So if you've got a molecule that's really twisted, does that mean that it's really, really chiral? And of course it doesn't because something's chiral or not chiral. You know, it's got a left handed or a right handed form or it hasn't. And so you have these really interesting dialogues and nuance when really it's the, the effects that we see because of this molecule. They're very strong effects or very weak effects. So the kind of absolutely fascinating thing about chirality is it's massively important to lots of different ways that that we exist. You know, it has a huge influence on, on life. Lots of our biological systems are chiral, DNA, amino acids and proteins and such, but also on the way that we design things. So if we're thinking about making a fragrance or a scent, then, then our noses will smell it very differently if we have a left-handed molecule or a right-handed molecule. In, in drug design, our bodies feel drugs very differently if we have a left-handed pharmaceutical drug, well, even non-pharmaceutical drugs, even recreational drugs, you have left-handed and right-handed versions that have very different potencies. So we think about it a lot in, in that kind of sector. And actually, my work is really thinking about how we can make use of chiral molecules in technologies. They make for better OLEDs, it turns out, <laughs> if we use chiral light emitters. So I think, I think chirality is the kind of overarching term that links anything that has a non-superimposable mirror image, handedness is really useful if we're thinking about things that have a left-handed or a right-handed form. And then kind of, you know, we talk a lot about disymmetry and, and, and the way that things interact with light or magnetic fields. And then we have to have a slightly different language. But the jargon is incredible. It kind of comes back to your point earlier on. It's how we, you know, like bubbles, how do we define what these things mean? It's really, really cool area. Well, the most important thing to know is if you really want to wind up a biologist, what you do is you design something like a corridor or some big design that has a, a coil that is supposed to be DNA and you make it coil the wrong way. <laughs> it winds biologists up. And so chemists. It's amazing. Um, and that's, that there is this amazing DNA. thing that basically all of life, as Jess said, has a right-handed, the DNA has a, a right-handed twist on it. All of life. Like, you know, I used you, you, I'd be interested, I guess it's an interesting thought exercise. If you had a whole other form of life that all twisted to the left, could you interbreed? <laughs> you know, if you had, would those be two separate species if one's all called to the left? But yeah, so that's how to wind up. And I have seen actually in some, um, I think it was a, bio, a really posh, you know, sort of really swanky biology lab in America somewhere. They had these amazing DNA designs down all their floors and they all coiled the wrong way. And I basically <laughs> walked in and went, and they went, yeah, we know, don't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing actually so uh, Flanders and Swan oh Robin's here Flanders and Swan wrote a really uh, wrote a song called I think it was Miss Alliance it was about the bindweed that um, um, one of them one twined, of them twined to, the right to the right and one of them twined to the left I can't remember what it was it was the honeysuckle twined to the right and the bindweed twined to the left and so they couldn't fall in love so look up your Flanders and Swan no, Robin how are you? <laughs> Well, because well, I've, I've been watching some of this and I've been really enjoying it. And I had a question because you're all very smart people. Can any of you give me a prediction of when we're going to see a marked downturn in the amount of hours in a day in which we swear at our printers? No, <laughs> definitely from my, my experience in the past. I've had this conversation with my brother for a long time about how printers are the worst piece of technology in the house. Mm -hmm. They just have never changed or become any better than what they were when we were at school. So, no, I can't give you that prediction. I'm sorry. That's yeah. so I'm disappointing. I'm really, I, I just say, like, I avoid this issue. Have you been trying to print des trying to print things then, Robin? While, well, uh, well, I enjoyed watching the show. I thought I'll catch up with the show. And then I thought, well, I've I'll join in at some point. So I'll get the printer. I'll just quickly print out the questions. <laughs> and, uh, well, I would say, I suppose florid is a, a, a word that would be used for the language. 
that's been mm-hmm. uh, coming at me. Yes. But I've got all the florid language out, and we're back at, uh, I would say, you certificate for the final 15 minutes. <laughs> very poetic with your profanity. Uh, this, uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry we missed that. <laughs> well, I think Stephen Pinker's book about where swearing comes from in the brain, I think I've got more than one place at least. I think we still haven't managed to get the geographical location of that. But I've really been enjoying it. So, um, And hello, everyone. Sorry, I was uh, up to some other things uh, this afternoon, including research for our episode about silent running that's coming out on uncanny hour which it turns out is the most upsetting film that's ever been made um have either of you seen silent running i know you won't have done helen of course not no very oh. talking about silent running running silently i had no idea that this was a film <laughs> oh it's an amazing film and it's all about uh, it's about the last three basically collections of plant life that exist which are no longer on the planet earth which are kept up in space um and i watched it again recently and then just mentioned it and had an outpouring of over 100 people going i saw that when i was nine i've never been able to go back it's the saddest thing i've ever seen my mother had to comfort me as i wept throughout the night it's a very beautiful film Uh, (laughs) but yes we're going to do an episode of uncanny hour shall i do the questions in reverse and then we'll find when we meet up where you got to um, so we we've just we've done just done cryorality. That's where we've got to. On well, the if questions. I, if, if I yeah. start from the bottom, we'll see if we can get all the way in the thirteen minutes left. Uh, and and the I know there's some that have come in dur- during the uh, during the show as well. But uh, Melanie uh, had a question, which was three uh, M dual lock strips appear to be magic. How to actually work? So magic versus science. <laughs> Who should we start with? This this sounds to me like the magic versus science is kind of you, Helen. I think possibly here, but it might. Um, uh, Jess, I, I looked at Anna's face. And Anna's face said, "Not me," which I know <laughs> the audience can't see. But every now and again, when we do this, because we uh, can see everyone's face, you go, "Ah, oh, that facial expression said, uh, uh-uh, no, 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 no." So. Helen uh, or Jess? Let's are see. they like a Velcro? Is it super, super strong Velcro? 3M is glue. I know that. But is I it like it's a tape? I, I suspect it might be 3M tape. Oh, and that that was my face was that I've never heard of these things. But is that like a Velcro <laughs> tape? Is it? Is it? It's not double sided tape. It's not a... I, I just assume different kinds of tape and the way we use them in science. <laughs> I always think about it in the physics department how much double sided tape and blue tack there is to let you do experiments. It's it's not what people might expect. But I yeah. think I think three M dual lock is pro- lock sounds like it's a velcro ish kind of thing, mm, right? Agree. Like you have two layers that hook together. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know, but I can. It's advanced, advanced velcro. velcro. Yeah. Oh. See, I do know that when I've done interviews with astronauts, sorry. Okay, so so the way Velcro works is just that it's hooks and loops. It's really clever. So basically there's there's one side which is kind of sort of fuzzy material that's basically got lots of little hoops in it. um, And that's the fuzzy side of the Velcro. And then the other side is has kind of almost rigid little hooks. And if you push a hook into the forest of loops, it's likely to get stuck on a loop. But if you pull it hard enough, the, the the hook will unbend and then it will slide out of all the loops. So it's basically a very clever, um, it's not quite a ratchet system, but if you push it one way, it will get stuck. But if you push the other way hard enough, it will uncoil. So that's how Velcro works. And this and isn't it an like... amazing material because it was a, one of those accidental discoveries. Like it was a, a Swiss outdoors person or kind of mountaineer. And they were studying the way that plants did this. You know, some plant seeds kind of hook on to their stem, I guess. Sorry to all biologists. I think that's probably completely non-technical. But you had this way that the plants connected. And they, in studying this, went out on a nice mountain walk, managed to come up with what became Velcro. So keep exploring outside. And also it's become something that, you know, there's so many of those in materials, Anna, that I feel like were just kind of a fluke that someone managed to find. Like post-it notes also. Or, yeah, totally. Or, but yeah. you know what that is, though? It's because people continually estimate the natural world. It really bugs me, this, because people are like, oh, this is an amazing thing. It's like, no, no, the natural, natural world is that complicated and elegant and clever all the time. It's totally. just it's not noticed. Yeah, so totally. So you appreciate it first. And then instead of thinking you're the clever person, they're like, oh, my God, I've just spotted a thing. And then it's all that clever. All of it yeah. is yeah. clever. We just, yeah, we see the of science all the time. Um, in the book I write about wool, there's a chapter on wool. And, you know, biology has had millennia to develop the most clever structures and the most clever materials to do really 
brilliant things with. So the material of wool is so molecularly complicated. Like it's built of these um, strands, which are twisted. Um, we were talking about that earlier. And then those are made into sort of bigger twists. So twisted around the other way into kind of ropes. And then those are twisted into other things. So there's kind of these structures out of structures out of structures of wool. Um, and that gives it these amazing materials properties, um, which are still unrivaled in the synthetic world. Like we have still never been able to make um, a jumper out of synthetic materials that can rival those of wool, which is one of the oldest natural materials that we use. It's, it's mind blowing. And it's why nanomaterials are so great, right? Because we can move our atoms atom by atom and build up molecules that might have the supramolecular s assembly of the strands that form mm. wool. I think it's so cool to think we can, instead of just taking something and going from the top, we can start from the bottom observe nature, look at these cool hooked plants, look at the structures in beetle shells and try and make that in a lab to do something functional. Mm. So our worlds collide often, Helen. We try. <laughs> to be fair, there is an advantage of having billions of mutation, heredity, natural selection <laughs> over maybe a century in a lab. So I think, you know, we might catch up. <laughs> um, we've got a, this is uh, from Anna, Annalisa, and I'll, I'll throw this to you first, Anna. She says, uh, could you make hydrocarbon encapsulating polymers for different disasters apart from oil for other toxic spills? Now, do you have any idea on that? Hydrocarbon encapsulating polymers? Yeah. I've not heard of these. Do any of you know what these are? I've Does heard of like yeah. they use for oil for, for sucking up when there's a spill like those things that we have in all wet labs in chemistry where you someone spills something and you're like throw over those right, right. and it sucks everything up i mean <laughs> not that that's ever happened but i've always had the thrill that it might every time i look at it i don't know i have no idea if people are do you have an idea anna if it's that kind of thing i think it is and i think they're they're they're, they're not super specific because if you have a spill you probably it's it's either um a water-based spill or an oil-based mm -hmm. spill. And so it's likely that if you've got one of each type, you'll pick it up quite easily. I mean, they're a bit, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think they've been used very much because for big, big oil spills, like it's just too much stuff. There's mm -hmm. usually, honestly, sadly, birds that do that a bit better. Um, and, and that's where the oil goes. But um, yeah, I think, but basically, if it's either oil-based or water-based, you've probably, that probably covers most things, I think. But I don't know. Don't know about the specifics. If there's, if there's a thing material scientists or chemists can do, they're probably doing it. So I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes. You know, if there's yeah. something that we can suck up or store or use in different ways, people are working on it. So I, I think the answer is probably to go and find the lab that is. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. But also, like we were just saying, you know, there are some naturally derived materials that are very, very good at this. I know that they sometimes use human hair in oil spills because human hair is excellent at kind of absorbing oils as well. So we might not actually need to develop new materials. Maybe we've already got them. What's nice is we're discovering that the reason that all the questions at the bottom are at the bottom is because they are the most maybe and I don't know questions. <laughs> and now by, by suddenly changing this rhythm, so I do apologise. Now, this one, I have no idea how true this is. This is from Tony, and this can be thrown out to all of you. Why does a mug of coffee cool quicker than a mug of tea? Now, I have not I think I must drink coffee quicker because I generally think tea goes colder quicker. Uh, maybe it depends where I drink it. But first of all, we're starting with you, Helen. Do, do you know how true yeah. this is? So basically, so, so there's a few things here. So the answer is probably that it probably doesn't. It's more to do with the container it's in and what you're doing to it. So, so you're more likely to perhaps to drink. So, so basically, both tea and coffee are almost entirely water. Uh, there is a tiny bit of some other stuff. It's a bit more other stuff for coffee than it is for tea. Um, it changes the colour very, very slightly. Um, and if you add milk to either one, that will also change the colour very slightly. So there's two things that might matter here. One of them is the container you put it in. So if you put it in a ceramic mug, um, that would be thicker or thinner. And you've got two you've got kind of two stages in the heat loss you've got heat going from the coffee into the mug and then from the mug into the environment those are the sort of rate limiting steps so i think if you put so, so it might be that you're more likely to drink coffee in a mug with a thick you know a thick candle maybe you're a delicate person who drinks tea in um delicate i have no i haven't can't remember the last time i saw a delicate china tea you know teacup however it would definitely tea would definitely cool more quickly either one would cool more quickly if it was in a very delicate thin mug because it's just losing heat more quickly to the environment the ceramic acts as an insulator um the other thing is is potential radiative losses from the surface so as anna mentioned before uh all all 
objects in the universe, macro objects, are radiating away heat, that the radiation they lose depends on the temperature. So that top surface of the tea, which is exposed to the environment, will be radiating away heat now. It is possible um, that there is a very small difference in the rate of radiation. The, they don't emit perfectly. Different objects have different... Um, some of the a black body is a perfect emitter and radiator and then things aren't quite perfect so there might be a tiny difference but i honestly don't think it's significant and the other thing that might matter is whether you've stirred it so if you stir um the movement of the liquid itself if you stir milk into your tea and you have a circulating movement you're kind of bringing more fresh tea or coffee to the surface and so you're bringing the warm stuff from the inside to the outside and that loses its heat and it gets replaced so so i think between the mug um and the stirring that probably explains most of the difference. Uh, so if you add sugar, for example, you might stir it and that makes it. And then there might be a tiny bit from how uh, um, the emissivity of the surface, but I don't think that will be significant. So I think con further controlled experiments would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I was going to suggest an experiment. I think it was pretty much the first physics experiment we did at school was it was called mum's mug of tea and you had to have milk in a teacup and no milk in it, you know, to <laughs> change the way you made your tea and then monitor the tea. I remember making the poster coming back to Anna's point about being the nerd. I remember <laughs> doing that. It was fantastic. But yeah, do definitely think about when you put the milk in, whether you leave the tea bag in, all of those different things will change the way that heat radiates and how quickly they cool down. Mm intrigues me then so obviously if you add sugar we're talking about stirring so we're talking about the idea it would cool fast but does it would there be a certain amount of sugar if added that would change the speed in which uh, the heat would radiate out and the speed not, in which it would get cooler not by a significant amount uh, so there is i mean if if you filled half of the mug with sugar <laughs> <laughs> then it might make a difference um but i would imagine yes not not otherwise mm. Now we've just had. Now here's another entry. This is a question that just come in from uh, Melvin, and this this involves uh, basically it's it, it's partly I suppose DIY and cleaning. It's about why there is an orange discoloration uh, in shower on shower walls and floors quite often. Can someone explain what caused the temporary orange discoloration on shower walls and floors? Uh, I wonder if it was some degradation gas of PVC, perhaps. Now again, I'm not aware of this orange discoloration. Who is? not me but it could be rust the only thing i i can't think of anything orange that should come out of your shower other than if there's rust in some kind of you know thing in the shower head i have you do get I, so sometimes if you have transparent polymers um like sealing the edges i think they might go orange after a bit so maybe that's the orange he's talking about i don't know if this is biological though it could it be some sort of mold I'm not sure. Clean your shower better is the yeah. really <laughs> conclusion. I think because we live in London, so we just have that lime scale everywhere, right? Like yeah. we just get build up of white around all of the water things. Covering about. all the orange stains. Mm. Right. So maybe I'm protected. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting, though, also because the last question, I think we're seeing the level of subjectivity where wherever Melvin's been, obviously, there's been some continuation of the, you know, the, the orange tainting of the showers mm -hmm. he's been using, which suggests Melvin perhaps might also be emitting some form of orange as well. Are you, no, I don't think you, I don't think you should, I think we have to be very careful here, Robin, about what we're implying about our audience. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't. I wouldn't consider it to be an insult if someone was able to, you know, like some kind of crazed ready bet Brett kid. If you remember, they had some kind of glow that uh, creates these orange. I, I, it sounds to me like a magical property. Um, we've got a question which uh, Helen, you've covered this before. We ask this every now and again, and it's always interesting when we have different guests on finding their opinion on this. This from the philosophical Yam Yam. Uh, how do we move forward with science as a society when there are so many conspiracies and people who believe them? It's so hard to get people to accept the truth behind the facts now i think there's an interesting thing here where i was recently reading a book uh, i think suspicious minds it was called about conspiracy theories which says if you actually look back through the newspaper columns and the letters as far back as as, as you can in terms of old copies of the times etc to the 19th century you will find there has always been quite a conspiracy mindset so sometimes it might appear that it's just because we're getting confronted by it due to social media but nevertheless the problem does remain where the conspiracy versus evidence is quite a battle so uh i don't know jess can i start with you yeah i 
think, I mean, my general answer is we need to fund science education better. You know, the last year has shown us more than ever before how important it is to have a scientifically literate society. And I think that systematic defunding of science teachers and thinking about, you know, especially in the UK, the way our curriculum is structured is really designed to let most people leave science really, really early in their lives. And I think if we had more of that kind of chemistry, biology, physics, more of this discussion like this that shows how intertwined all of science is and how we're all working on these problems to get to a better answer. No one knows the answer immediately. We're working on them. I think investing in science education and investing in our science teachers would be one way we can get towards really tackling misinformation and conspiracy conspiracy theories and then having really effective communicators of science, you know, people like Helen and Anna really thinking about the way that we we tell the stories about science on a personal level so that people don't feel afraid when you go and, and tell them that we've got these amazing vaccines. They feel excited by the prospect of science. So I, I think, yeah, we need to pay our science teachers better because they're the most important part of society in all of this. There's a really interesting thing, which I think is true for climate and may well be true for other things, which is that humans are really good at, at, at you know, Most motivated reasoning. And there's actually some evidence that suggests that the ones who are better educated in science, they kind of think they're cleverer. So they go, well, so they, they re, they, their emotions take them into a viewpoint and then they think, oh, well, I know science. So, so they, they're actually clever at backing up their own argument at cherry picking. So, so I think science education by itself, I agree it's important, but I also think there's, you also, there, it also can produce a class of people who think they know better and who are educated enough to find the arguments that support, you know, them without critically thinking about themselves one thing i would say about this is the way it isn't to do it is to shout you're wrong at other people it's to listen the way of all of these things is listening but anna i've said this before like robin said so anna should, should give her opinion on yeah all. i mean, agree that, that science communication is a really key thing for me the the main thing is is it's a trust is, issue and so as scientists, if we're wanting to become more trustworthy, then for me, I think it's important that we humanize ourselves. Um, and, you know, there's this there's this divide and this kind of misunderstanding that scientists are somehow either cleverer or, um, you know, kind of superior in some way, which is completely not true. Um, so for me, what I'm trying to do in my work is to really kind of show the human side of scientists and the the, the fallibilities and the, and the worries and kind of all the human um, sort of connection and emotion that goes into science um because it, it shouldn't be seen as something that is done in the ivory towers and is kind of is um, inaccessible to everybody um because it's all just done by everyday people um so so that's the key thing for me is is building trust by communicating well but also by humanizing the scientists Brilliant. it was kind of like you. when the first vaccinated person in the UK became a celebrity overnight because it was a person you could associate with the vaccine. It wasn't just we've got yeah. this new COVID vaccine. Here's the science. This is what mRNA is. And never anyone walks away and forgets it was a human that you associated yeah. with that. I think, yeah, completely agree with Anna on that one. Yeah. And storytelling and telling human stories about science. That for me is the key. I think I, I was interviewing some people for a, a book I've been working on, uh, teachers who say one of the things that the problems that they all felt was that science in schools is taught to eventually be for scientists so if you are really good at science that that's that, that there isn't that kind of science which says this is just you know you're taught english not because you're going to be a novelist or a poet you're taught history not because you're going to be a historian but they the four that i particularly spoke to all felt that science is and this is for people who will become scientists mm, so it will weed that. out those mm. who might be interested but it's not going to be their, their their career. And I think that's an interesting take on one of the areas perhaps we really need to to, to look into. It's really difficult because I think you're, you're right in a way, you're, but you would teach it in, if you were going to take that to its logical extent, you would have a course for people who thought they were going to do science and a course for people who didn't because they would be different, different courses. You would look at things in a different way. Uh, like, you know, I did a thing for A-level Scottish or Scottish hires or something in physics the other day. They teach physics in a way that no physicist uses but it's useful to think about if you're not ever going to do any more physics. But it, it's also when some, if someone is going to go on and do science, you kind of you're going to have to unpick a lot more of it to get them to the next stage on. So I think there's a really interesting uh, because models are we teach science models 
and we're not very clear about that and, and there's a point where the model and the reality overlap to you know you drop an apple it goes down we're not having an argument about that it's a very well predicted process but the models in like quantum models and models of atoms it's much more like there's a lot of there's a way we think about it that isn't reality and there's different ways of thinking about it that seem contradict each other and they don't they just take in different amounts of detail and so i think the interesting thing about that i agree with you but i also think that it's a it's a much deeper ethical problem because what would go in those two courses to cuz you know to, to to cover to sort of help everyone get to the place where they would most like to be so i think it's it's not a simple thing to do couldn't you just remove one of of those lessons a week which is another really boring lesson which is memorizing an equation without any particular underlying knowledge of it and again it's a thing that i've a lot of people seem to feel that the way that the interference in the curriculum and a lot of science teachers that i speak to are not teaching science how they would like to uh which includes as anna was saying more of the stories more of the senses as well that science isn't just a success story that Mm -hmm. a lot of people feel that the talk of failure is a re- because that's why you always get that thing oh scientists say this now but they were wrong about that and that mm. always entirely ignores the fact that all of you know that the different levels of wrong which we've talked about many times before here i completely agree i think in the states though they do have these courses my my friends who are uh, lawyers did a course at university which was physics for poets they do have those kind of things because they have a much more wide reaching curriculum. And I don't know whether the outcome is you have a more scientifically content society. You know, certainly in the past few years, we've not seen that that's the case. So so I don't know. I, I completely agree with Helen that they have to be delivered with some kind of nuance and that we can get rid of memorizing equations and actually make use of kind of the creative aspects of science in the ways that we teach. Mm. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, uh, reminder that uh, Anna's book, Handmade, A Scientist's Search for Meaning Through Making, is out in about a fortnight. And that's roughly what it's going to look like. <laughs> uh, and it might be exactly what it's going to look like. Is that the proof or is that the final one? It's final copy. Yep. So that's what it's going to look like. And uh, Jesse's book, Nano, The Spectacular Science of the Very, Very Small, is out now. And that's exactly what that looks like and uh helen's book of course is still out as well uh and uh which is a great book as well and again one which links so much of our our normal everyday life with the physics which is underlying in so many of these things thanks very much everyone uh reminder that uh patreon if you're a patreon supporter that's brilliant that allows us to do these things which are free access for everyone and they also allow us to do things like tips for existence which this week is going to have chris jackson on who of course a new episode of Uncanny Uncanny Hour, which is all about about I Am Legend, Legend, the the book, and then the three films, as well as some would say four films, uh, based on it with uh, Charlie Higson and Kim Newman and Jenny Roan, who's been on this before, because as usual, even though we're dealing with kind of strange, uncanny films, we like to have a cell biologist give their take on how the virus might take over the the human race. Uh, And the next one we're going to do is going to be Silent Running, as I mentioned before, with Stuart Lee, Mark Kermode, uh, Brian Cox, uh, Linda Merrick, and loads of others as well. Thanks to our producer, Trent Burton. Thank you to everyone. We'll be back next Sunday. I'll be back on time as well uh, at three o'clock. I'm now going to go and swear at my printer. Why don't you do some swearing at your printer too? You probably want to. (laughs) 